Carrick Summer Lecture Series. Wouldn't you know it, with this glorious weather, we're all basking in the sunshine and the strawberries. The third lecture tonight is by Ian Doyle, the archaeology of pre-Norman Wexford. So we're off down to Tintern Abbey. Tintern's a favourite place of ours to get to when we leave the glorious surroundings of the Irish National Heritage Park. We'll see you there and enjoy the lecture. Evening folks, I'm not going to keep it for long. I just want to very quickly explain the Carrie Gate 50 series of talks and why we're here and why Ian's very agreed, kindly agreed to give us a lecture. So I know for most of the people in the room, certainly the locals, they'll be quite aware that it's the 800th anniversary of William Marshall the first day. And Tintern is a series of talks sort of featuring Marshall themes. But there's also an 850th anniversary course in Wexford this year for both the coming of the Normans, but also the, for the construction of the Carrick site. And as I've gone around the county in the last few months talking about Carrick, I sort of heard again, I don't know where the Carrick site is, or I'm not aware of the Carrick site. And I generally say you know exactly where the Carrick site is, especially if you're from Wexford, because everybody is familiar with that viewpoint in Wexford. Okay, so you're driving from the Ferry Carrick Hotel and you see the round tower. What not everybody knows is that round tower is a 19th century fake, and it's built through the earliest recorded Anglo Norman castle in Ireland. So it's 850 years old this year. Okay, but just in terms of the landscape, you can see it there. All right, but the more familiar view is this one here. So that's Roach's Castle, the 16th century castle on the north side of the Slaney. So it's an 850 year old castle that we started excavating 18 months ago. And the first thing we decided when we were sitting down to devise our excavation strategy was we couldn't let the 850th birthday go on past. So we wanted to make sure there was a series of events to bring the site back into the public consciousness. So this is a site, as you see it from drone shot, just as we're about to commence excavations. You can see one side where you can just see the older 1980s digs that we re reopened, and you can see the other side before the park had removed the forestry. So nothing of this site could be seen a couple of years ago, all right? And maybe that's why it sort of passed out of public consciousness. But it shouldn't, because it's such an important archaeological site. It's the first point where the Normans built a permanent settlement in the whole of the country. And if you think of the, I suppose, the resonance of that um, for the subsequent 850 years of our history, and there's a lot more there. So there's mills, there's a 14th century church, there's a possible town, one of the first ever Anglo-Norman deer parks stretches back this way, there's only 50 of them in the whole country. So there's a lot of things to see at Carrick. Um, the reason I'm even telling you this is, at the minute we have students from all over the world excavating the site, and we're open from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, and we actively encourage members of the public to come up, view the excavation, see the finds, see how an archaeological site works. So we're very much a public archaeology project. We're not behind closed doors. So the whole reason we are there is to bring the site back into community memory, work with the Irish National Heritage Park, um, and basically welcome members of the public in to see the day. And of course, the park itself is well worth a visit in its own right. The excavation is just another good reason to go. There's plenty of reasons to go and see the park. All right? However, because it's the 850th anniversary, we wanted to mark that. We wanted to sort of have a series of events. So these are the events we have planned, and you can see we're on number three here, so we're about halfway through. We've already had lectures in Wexford Library and Ferns Castle, so we're trying to bring the site out around the county. And we have another lecture in two weeks with Dr. Michael Potterton from Manu in Wexford Library. So we've left, I hope, flyers in everybody's chair, if anybody wants to come in any of these events. We realise these lectures aren't for everyone, and they're obviously for an adult audience, they're not really <coughs> suitable for families. So we have an open day on July 26th in the park itself, we're back into the park, and on that we'll have storytelling, we'll have battle reenactments, we'll have UCD coming down to experimental archaeology, we'll have finds displays, we'll have days in the medieval life, we'll have an archaeology kids camp. So there'll be lots and lots and lots for children to do as well as adults. So if you have grandchildren or children, nieces, nephews, there'll be something for everyone that day. And definitely the highlight of our calendar of the, the seven or eight events we've organised is our international conference in October. So that's October 18th and 19th. And if you go into any of these sites or if you search for the Carrie Project or Irish Archaeology Field School, that's who I work with, you any of these websites here you'll find details on it. We have 21 speakers coming to the park to talk about all things Anglo-Norman in October. Um, and that's Anglo-Norman Wexford, the Carrick site itself, and Ireland at large. So again, there's, there should be something for everyone. That's day one of the conference, and day two is hands-on practical sessions. So if any of you have aspirations to be archaeologists, or if any of you are archaeologists and want a bit of professional development, you'll actually get to handle medieval pottery, you know how it was made, why it was made, how it was put together. You'll get to handle do archaeological remains, understand how we identify species and trauma, etc. 
And at that conference as well, we'll launch our first book, all right? So the first book in Carrick will come out, which has 12 chapters, and which Ian kindly agreed to co-author a chapter on. So um, that's the plug over. If anyone has any questions about any of those events, we'd love to see any of them. But I'll hand you over to Ian now. I just want to say thanks very much for being here, and we'd love to see you either in the park or at some of the other events or at the conference. Thanks very much. Um, thanks, Dennis. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I was just saying to Margaret when I came in, the last time I was in this room was, I'm kind of embarrassed to say when, but it was a long time ago, and I was digging skeletons at the back of the room. Um, so we're, we're in good company. Um, I worked on the excavations here in 1994, there I've said it now, um, and it was just a stunning place. So when I heard that there was a time, or an opportunity to come back here, I, I didn't have to be asked twice. Um, my abiding memory of, of that summer was there was a World Cup on, and I had a lift down every morning, but I had to hitch back in the afternoon. And in the days when Ireland were playing in the World Cup was in America, um, you'd only have to put your thumb out like that and a car would skid to a halt and somebody would say, are you going to watch the match? <laughs> <laughs> and it was just a national fever. It was really interesting. Um, so anyway, I, have a, I suppose what I'm saying in a roundabout way is I have a soft spot for, for Tintern Abbey. Um, and it's, a, it's an amazing spot. Um, so everybody is talking at the moment, or a lot of people are talking at the moment about the Anglo-Normans, um, 850. But what did they come to? What was this place like? What was the archaeology of it like? What can we tell about it? So that got me thinking a while ago. Oh, I'd like at the hang of these controls now. Yeah. Um, what am I going to talk to you about? Well, why is this period important? What do we currently know? And what I was going to do is talk a little bit about the early church in County Wexford. Beggarin, Kilmokey, Carnsore, Ferns, Tamon, a little bit about religion, settlement and trade, and towns. Um, and a couple of years ago, Bernard Brown and myself did a book of essays. You know, Bernard is over from Old Ross. We did a book of essays in memory of the late Dr. Billy Colfer. And it, it started, I started thinking about that pre-Norman period in County Wexford. And I went back to a visit by the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland to Wexford in 1930. And basically they were saying that there's not that much hair from the early medieval or pre-Norman period. Um, it's the castles and Gothic churches of medieval Ireland which claim the chief share of our interest. I suppose it's kind of hard to argue where we are this evening. Um, on the whole, the Wexford region belongs to the last mentioned type of excursion centre. For although the remains of earlier periods of present, those of the medieval centuries are here the more important. Um, kind of hard to argue, actually. But when you look and when you think about it, we do have quite a bit of archaeology here from the earlier period. Um, but by virtue of a whole series of accidents, just kind of trends, it's never really been looked at. Um, so for instance, these are archaeological excavations carried out 1920 to 1996, and these are 1997 to 2009. Um, so a lot in Dublin, a lot around Cork where, or Kerry, which you have a university in, similarly around Galway, but the lack of any kind of university or institute of higher learning here with an interest in archaeology means that things like that didn't really reach those kind of high numbers that you see here. Mm -hmm. Similarly, 1997 to 2009, look at Cork, look at the area around Dublin, where infrastructure development is finding things. Wexford's a little bit of a laggard, but that's changed a little bit in the last number of years, and I'll show you some new information that came from that. Um, but why is, why is this period important? Or this, this period before the Anglo-Normans, say from 500 to say 1100 or 1150 even. Well, it's when Christianity arrived. It's when we start to see towns developing. Um, and it's the heyday of the ring fort. And that's, this is the density of ring forts across the country. A lot of them, uh, it's, um, as you can see the map is blacker here in the West. Now, I think one of the reasons for that is they're simply more likely to be retained or preserved 
in this corner, this part, these parts of Ireland, you get a higher preponderance of tillage, um, generations and generations of it. And monuments like this, which today are just a bank in a ditch, um, but which would have looked like this in the past, uh, maybe two houses, a palisade, um, a causeway in, um, the homestead of a family, uh, maybe keeping livestock here, processing cereal, um, churning butter here. Um, this guy is, look, he's coming in with his fish. Um, you might shelter stock in them overnight. So we have about 30, possibly even 40,000 of these across the country. Um, so it's very much the rise of the ring fort and in County Wexford, this is the distribution of them. Um, so there's quite a lot, in particular down around this part of the county. Um, again, this might be just an accident of survival. Um, but very, very few actually excavated in County Wexford. Um, this is a very, very small one that was excavated in Tamona. I think that's near Tamon um, in the early 1970s. And just a little trench put across it here. Uh, it was probably about to be bulldozed by um, agricultural works. And what it found was that there was a ditch here and a ditch here. Um, so it was a bivalve one. And the more, the higher the social status in ring forts, the more ditches you have. So if you had a trivalent one, you were probably a king, probably at the social apex, as a general rule of thumb. So there was no dating evidence from this, but most of them date to about 700 to eight or 900. Construction seems to have stopped of these ring forts around about 1,000. Um, when Gerald of Wales, Gerald of Barry, Gerald Cambrensis came to Ireland, he said that nobody was living in these. So we think that the construction tailed off in the, the centuries just before the Anglo-Normans came. Um, so when I was thinking about this paper, um, I started looking at the, the Enniscorty bypass. Um, it's due to open, I think, later this month. But there was a lot of archaeological work done on it. You can actually pick out the route um, in a line. And in this town in Corbally, just northeast of Enniscorty, um, there was one really interesting site uncovered. Um, it's on this little low hill in Corbally townland. Um, and it's, a site, it's an enclosure. Um, so you can see the way it's a little bit raised up. Um, excavated in 2010, 2011. And now with radiocarbon dates, we know that there's a heart. It's just outside it, I think, here. Um, 7th to 8th century. And then the enclosure was quite big, 65 metres by 23. So that's 65 metres. Was it a ring fort? Possibly. But what they seem to have been doing here was making iron because they found 151 kilos of iron slag just in this small area here. So that's twice my body weight in, in iron slag. So I'm sure they, they had a bit of fun moving it back to, to their, their site area. So that'll be analyzed. Um, so there are, I suppose the point I'm making is that if you have, this site was completely unknown before that road was built. It showed up in geophysics, and when it was excavated, they found out this kind of information. Um, it seems to date, uh, what, 10th century to middle of the 12th century, so possibly just before the Anglo-Norman period. Um, so sites like this do turn up, and again, it probably slightly proves, where is it, that point about the density here being higher in this, these less intensively farmed areas, whereas sites like the one I just showed you are probably leveled here. So there are accidents of survival as well. And the other thing about um, the archaeology of County Wexford in this period is there's no annals. There's nobody recording, you know, like the annals of Ulster or the annals of the Four Masters in detail in the southeast. Um, there's no really fine metalwork from the southeast. There's no really fine high crosses or sculpture either. So it's, it's almost one of these forgotten regions of, of early medieval Irish archaeology. But I hope, I hope I'll prove to you that there is a lot still worthy of, of consideration. Um, there's another ring fort. This is uh, Killen Connolly Beg, just south of Kilmuckridge. Um, this is it on the first edition Ordnance Survey map. Now, I'm, the reason I'm showing you this is to see how vulnerable, see how close it's getting to the sea, to see the difference between 1840 mm -hmm. and about five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, 
and effectively this is climate change and erosion. So I'd be I'd be thinking at some point in the next 10 years where go the government um, we might have to make a decision on a lot of monuments like this around the country. Do we let them go or do you do a little trench and to see what you can salvage and what you learn before it's lost? Mm -hmm. But there, there are big challenges like that ahead for, for all of us in terms of climate change. Um, so that's my, my little bit of insight on ring forts. Um, the church. Now in a way, that Dennis mentioned the, the Irish Heritage Park. It looks a little bit like it without the round tower. Um, in the, the church site that's there, the round tower is up on the obviously the site he mentioned at Carrick. Um, but what I wanted to show you here is before I start talking about places like Ferns and Timon, is a kind of a, a reconstruction of what an early Irish church would be like. So you'd have a church, possibly a round tower. But what I really want to point out is do you see the curving boundary here? See that? Mm -hmm. uh, and then possibly another one here. These are a feature of all these early Christian church sites. Um, a boundary, a sanctuary, um, to show a spiritual boundary, a, a boundary between a holy place and the outside world. So there's another one. This is another one from Monaghan in Askeen. So again, see the little curving boundary here? Because what generally happens, or what happens in a lot of cases, is that these boundaries get fossilized as if these grow into towns over the centuries these get fossilized in street patterns just like in Armagh so do you see this mm -hmm. there's your former boundary and there's another one mm -hmm. so sometimes you get them in pairs an inner one and an outer one um, so Armagh was obviously a really significant holy place now if you go if you drive to Dublin uh, from Wexford and you go through Ballycanoe it's always struck me that as you go around the church there's a big sweep of a bend and I put a I put money on it that that's something like that's exactly like this where it's been fossilized in the road but there are other examples um, this is uh, anybody guess where this is where yeah Cairnsore Cairnsore Point in Nethertown um, the wind turbines now are to give away. Um, and this is where the ESB and the government were going to build a nuclear power station in the 1970s. And there was murder over it. Um, so it never happened. But um, this little church site here was excavated. And again, you see the little, you see the little curvilinear mm -hmm. circular boundary around it? Um, and I, I think we, we probably forget about it, but it was actually a really, really important excavation because, well, there it is, yeah. Excavated 1975. Um, there's a, it's, Saint, it's known locally as St. Vogue's or St. Vaux. Now, there is a suggestion that it's attached to a guy called St. Fecken of Four, who died in 664. And the reason for that is his feast day is the 20th of June. And that's the date that the pattern is celebrated at St. Vogue's. Now, there was three phases of activity here. Um, it's a lovely walk at the moment uh, to go around there because there's all the paths because of these, but um, they get a bit noisy because it's a very windy spot. Um, but what was really interesting about this excavation was this. Um, so in black here, we have the existing church. Um, this one, okay. right? So that's what the black lines are. Um, but when it was excavated inside it, they found this layer of burning, um, 1975. And it was a structure that had burnt down. And when they looked further, the two archaeologists, um, Mary Cahill and Anne Lynch, they found these post holes here. And a post hole is where you have a timber post driven into the ground. And it, over time, it, it gets pulled out or it rots. So you end up with a different color, maybe a softer, looser fill within this, this hole. So it's really the hole left behind by a former post. Mm -hmm. And the posts were identified as being a little building. Mm -hmm. um, and because it was in a church and over burials, it was a fair assumption that this was uh, a very early timber church. Um, so 
it's probably one of the earliest known churches that we have in Ireland to date uh, that burnt down. Um, if you ask me to guess it, I'd say it's probably 7th century, possibly even earlier. Um, but it's very, very small. We got here. Yeah. So this probably isn't the easiest one to make out, but here's Karen Soar. There's our little church inside of it. Um, but here's another one in Kerry, found under another church. So roughly around the same size. Um, another one here, also in Kerry, a place called Cahill Um, This is a bigger plan of it. This is probably early 6th century. Um, so what you're probably looking at are some of the earliest churches of some of the first Christian communities in Ireland. Um, and the fact that the one in Cairnsore was built over some of the burials. Um, it may have been a shrine church or um, a place where you went and just the small size of it, you'd really only fit one or two people in it. Somewhere where you go and say prayers for the dead, um, maybe over a saint, maybe over a, an early founder of, of the of the, 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 the settlement. Um, so that's Karen Soar. Um, <coughs> so I, I, I suppose that what I'm really arguing is that when you look, there's a lot more insights and knowledge and wealth and depth to this early medieval archaeology in Wexford than we give ourselves credit for. Similarly, this is Beggarin in Wexford Harbour. It's now reclaimed. Um, this is a former island. And this is supposedly pre-patrician, in other words, before Patrick, because there was Christianity in Ireland before Patrick. Um, it doesn't look like much today. There's a ruined church. Um, but in the 19th century, all of these stones, cross-inscribed slabs, were recorded. Um, it was a place of pilgrimage, and that's where people were going at the time. Um, it was also raided by the Vikings on several occasions. Um, but there's also, when you, when you dig into it, um, so this is on the first edition Ordnance Survey map. So this is Beggarin. This was the Wexford Harbour, the very northern reaches of it. It's the North Slobs now. So this is the area that the, the white front, the geese, spend all of their time in since reclamation. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the middle of the 19th century, when you were doing the reclamation, uh, there you are, 1847, there was a guy from the Geological Survey there, 1873, and he started recording these rows of big oak piles that were turning up. Um, and there were, each pile was about 45 centimetres thick, uh, 45 by 23 centimetres thick, and they were 122 centimetres apart. Now he didn't figure out how long they were running, but they seemed to be running from here out. Um, now, that kind of oak in the early medieval period is a huge investment in terms of time, resources, and woodland. Um, so my suspicion is that, he, he called it a causeway, but we could probably better see it as a bridge or a jetty. Now the question is, was it a jetty just running out here and stopping? Or was it a bridge out to one of these islands? In which case, it would have been about three, three or four hundred meters in length. Now, that's not impossible because we know that there were building bridges in the 8th and 9th century at Clonmacnoise. And there's also an amazing example of a timber bridge in the River Cashin in County Kerry from the pre-Norman period as well. Um, and technologically, this, this, the, the area before reclamation here would have been just like a lagoon. Um, because even today, the water in the harbour is quite shallow at times in this particular area. So, it may well have been that we have evidence for an early timber bridge in the Wexford Harbour area. Um, now, I see John Flynn is here, and John knows far more about Kilmokey Island in near here than, than I do, because um, the Schlieve Culture Heritage Projects Group started doing a geophysical survey project here about, what, five years ago, John? About five years ago. Yeah. Um, and what it is, is it's this ecclesiastical enclosure. See the circular boundary again? Mm -hmm. With a church here. Um, lovely little, little cross and some um, parts of an old early medieval mill, millstone. And it's on a former island in the river uh, Waterford Harbour. So you've got the power station here. Um, then this is leading down towards Hookhead. Um, but it's a 
a site with an amazing history. Um, it's in the records. It's known as Inishtivla, um, Etter u Kinsale August Nadeshi. So between A Kinsale, which is County Wexford, uh, roughly, uh, McMurrah's tribe, and Nadeshi, Waterford, um, found, it seems to have been founded by two sons of A of Artley. That's Artley near Gorin, not not Dublin. Um, Kil Machnay seems to be where the name comes from. The Church of the Sons of Aid. Um, now, there was a very senior cleric from here in 697, um, a guy called Sudbar of Inish Tevla, who was a guarantor of the Law of Adamnon. The Law of Adamnon was a major piece of legislation in uh, the late 7th century. But we also know that there was at least four Viking raids on it. A22, 953, um, by, nobody, by, by Olaf Kuron, the very famous king of Leinster, or sorry, king of, of Dublin. Um, and again in 962, the Vikings didn't waste time raiding places that weren't worthwhile. <laughs> they went for places that were well worth their while. So on Great Island, and even judging by the size of it, um, if, it's a, if it's a serious place, probably um, on a routeway with a ferry point across the, the harbour, the, the Waterford Harbour Estuary here. Um, So these are all John and his group's images. So there's our enclosure here, a LiDAR image which the group got from um, Ordnance Survey and from, they got a, guy, a geophysicist called Kevin Barton to help them generate. This is an old map from around, around 1900 um, showing a survey of it. Um, and then the results that, this is in the, I'm gonna keep me honest, this is in this quadrant here when they did some geophysical surveys. Um, another little enclosure here um, with a possibility of a building within it. Um, some more activity here. Um, and I think, John, this was the area in the north east. Northeast. Yeah, a very large structure here, rectangular, um, maybe 20 meters by, by 40 even. Um, and this is the boundary ditch. That's yeah. insane boundary ditch. Yeah. yeah. Anything you'd like to say? Or? I know, I no? know. That's that image of number one. Yeah. That's on the inside. That's the new uh, ditch that we discovered. That, you know, it's not the boundary one with the pass. Yes. But it's, it's another one. Yeah. About 20 meters inside. Yeah. Uh, going around with a parallel if you want to say parallel to the yeah. outside one, you know. Yeah. So it seems to have been uh, five hours. Okay, good. So the lads did this project and they published it in the, the essay, the book that we did for, for Billy Call for Medieval Wexford. And I always point it as an example of a really, really good community driven project that was producing stuff like this. Um, so here in this part of County Wexford, there are community groups doing amazing projects like that. So well done, John and all the lads. Um, will we go to Tamon? Um, I'll show you a few interesting things about Tamon. Um, a couple of years ago, Tamon, I, I found myself spending a lot of time there on a bicycle. Um, I, I like cycling and my route always seemed to take me through Tamon because I was trying to understand it from the point of view of, uh, of an archeologist. And this is an early photograph from the 1970s, but when you're in Timon, Timon is actually a really interesting place. Um, it was founded, it's an early, very early monastic foundation, probably in the last half of the 6th century, by a guy called St. Fontan, or, or Mona. Um, so the name then comes from Chach, the house of Mon, Chach Mon. Um, so he's from Eastern Donegal, and What's really interesting about him as well is that there's a Latin life written all about him. Now, he seems to have been the contrariest individual you could have met. Um, he didn't tolerate, I'm going to say he didn't tolerate fools gladly. He didn't tolerate much from what I, what I read of it. Um, but it's a really interesting life because it was written around 800. It's, it's a very early life as saint, saints' lives go. A lot of them are only written around 1200. Um, but he tells in this, the story is told that um, the lands were granted by a king of the fort. So you know when you, 
we have two baronies in the south, the very south, Fort and Bargy. Yeah. Um, Ibarga uh, is Bargy, named after the Ibarga kingdom. And then Fort is the fort named after a fort dynasty. So they gave Acha Liadrum, I think it's the Grey Ridge, uh, to Monu to set up a monastery. Um, so late 6th to early 7th century for a foundation. Um, indications of at least four churches, portions of a high cross, um, tower house here as well. But when you look at it then you have to ask, uh, another church here actually, um, with some stone crosses as well. Um, this is the Mart site, I'll mention that in a minute. Um, so this photograph from the 1970s. But when you look at it, it's very hard to pick up the fact that what you see there in this photograph, I'll show you another one now, that it's an early monastery. You know, the, show the, I showed you the image of, of um, Armagh, some of those reconstruction drawings, and you're going, sorry, what's going on in Timon? Who are you fooling? But when you look, you can actually pick it up because um, this is a Google image from 2011. Do you see the lines here? And this one as well. Do you trust me on this? Do you see that line? Yeah. 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 Um, and when you look out, this is the Mart site here. This is a, an early church site this is with some stones crosses. Do you see all the field systems out here? Yeah. Um, and then there's some more stuff going on here. Um, and this church site here is full of all these early crosses. Um, that's their, their rough drawings of them. Um, and the, when the Mart site was redeveloped for housing in 1999 to 2000, an archaeologist called Claire Mullins was, uh, under the planning, was asked to go in and to do some excavation. And she found this, this is just a rough drawing she, she did for me, um, these ditches, now she couldn't really align them in terms of the monastic settlement, but this one in particular, ditch one, produced a radiocarbon date of AD 95 to 445, so early Iron Age. Mm. And then she was getting other dates, 1098 or later AD, 1405 to 1500. So, and then there's another one, this ditch, uh, 535 to 870 AD, so that's 6th century to 9th century over here. Um, so I'm sure if you sat down and you looked and did a little bit more survey work, you could make a lot more sense of that. So when you try to put it all together then, um, let's get that. Yeah, if you look at the image I showed you of the crop marks here, and then there's another ditch was found here in an excavation, you start to get a picture of a very large enclosure that runs around it. Now, I did this map a couple of years ago, do you remember the gas pipeline came in from Great Island into town? Yeah. Well, it went through to Mun. So I rang the archaeologist one day and I said, uh, tell me this, did you ever find a ditch crossing the main street at any point here? And he said, nope. And I thought, damn. <laughs> and then he said, but we found one here. <laughs> so I'd say essentially it was something like that, probably a little bit bigger. Now, he didn't get the date. It was down quite deep. And I think it was around where there's a kind of a public health HSE building. It was just at the road there. Mm -hmm. So we know that the, 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 that monastic part of Timon is there. That boundary is there. And if you look hard enough, you can find it. And it's a kind of place that would repay a lot more study if you had a bit more time to actually get out and do. Um, what, you, what I would do is I'd do some geophysics in this area, some geophysical survey. Uh, maybe a trench here to try date these um, but it's it's a really interesting town and it's a really interesting monastic site but it's it's almost an undiscovered side of it. Can I ask a silly question? You mentioned geophysics, is that kind of like x-ray? Yes, or yeah. Well you'll, you'll know geophysics inside out by the time I'm finished with ferns <laughs> and, and the geophysics and ferns that I'm going to show you now are stunning. Um, ferns now, Ferns is another interesting spot. Um, I used to drive through Ferns and I'd often be thinking, or even going through it on the, nearby on the train, um, there's a lot more to this place than meets the eye. I must sit down someday and try to get a handle on it. Um, so I made a start on it. And um, it's founded by St. Aidan or St. Madoch. 
uh, St. Moog, in the late 6th to early 7th century. Now he seems to be from Cavan. Um, there's a Cavan association there. And this is the, the cathedral, uh, a high cross in front of it. Now the crosses seem to be moved around very much in the 18th and 19th centuries. So they're not in their original positions. And the cathedral church was very, very heavily modernized um, and renovated. A part of it's rebuilt in the middle of the 19th century. Um, but there is this building slightly out in the field, um, St. Mary's. And it's a really interesting building because there is a school of thought. Um, it was founded by Dermot McMurrah in the 1160s. Um, that it was his, it was to be his royal chapel. It was to be where he wanted to be buried. And when you look at it, um, when you know Cormac's chapel on the Rock of Cashel, it's a lovely Romanesque building built by the McCarthy's. Um, it's a little bit like it in terms of the layout, uh, a vaulted area here. Um, I think it was Dermot McMurrah showing his pretension, um, but we all know where that ended. Um, yeah, Ferns backed the right horse, Tamon didn't. We are currently in the Diocese of Ferns. Now, if you, if you look at any of the modern dioceses, um, any place that provided a name to a diocese in the 12th century was a political hotspot um, because it was a church that had allied itself with the ruling kings at the time. So Ferns at the time, the 12th century, when all these dioceses were put together, the church reform, uh, early in the 12th century, was a royal monastic site for the Cavanaghs, the, sorry, the MacMurras. Um, so they, they really backed the right horse, whereas Tamun didn't. Um, they, at one point they went to war with the monks of Ferns, um, and there was a lot of monks lost their lives in the battle. Um, and they seemed to be allied with other lesser kings, like the kings of Fortin uh, and Bargi. Um, and they disappeared a little bit into obscurity. Um, um, so there's Ferns. That's a, a Bing image, and there's the Augustinian priory that MacMurrah set up. Here's the cathedral. And what's interesting when you drive into Ferns is you come in, say, from the Dublin Road, it'll shortly be the old Dublin Road, won't it? Um, and it rises up, and it's really on a ridge. Um, so this is almost like a finger that juts out. And then up here, you have another high point where the castle is, the 13th century Marshall Castle. So they're, com they're both commanding high ground. Um, and that, that's a common enough feature. Um, and again, the fact that the, the Anglo-Normans put a castle here suggests that this was a place of huge importance. Uh, but about five years ago, the state archaeological research body called the Discovery Programme started showing an interest in ferns. And they came and they did a geophysical survey of most of this field here. And the results were really, really interesting. Um, so this is effectively uh, like an x-ray of the, of the complex. So this is the Augustinian Abbey that MacMurrah founded. This is the cathedral. This is the old Dublin Road. So this is, I think there's a centra up here and the post office is up here. Um, so what you see are all of these lines and features and marks which are buried, backfilled archaeology in the ground. And there's a couple of things that are really interesting. Um, do you remember we talked? Remember I mentioned enclosures. Well, if you look at it, um, remember I showed you that slide of Armagh with the, the street pattern around it. Well, this hasn't been fossilized in the street pattern, but what you do see is look at this ditch running across here. And that runs probably up around like that, but there's also an outer one. Look at this one. Now it gets a bit faint there. But you can see that one. Yeah. And then there's another building just put on top of it here, mm. a two-aisled one. Um, and interestingly, this inner boundary here has this Augustinian priory founded by MacBurra plonked right down on it too. So what that would suggest is that certainly in the 12th century, this boundary had gone out of use. Um, it, there may have even been a symbolic gesture putting this down on top of it. Um, um, but there's a lot going on here in this, this green field. Um, 
But when you try and make sense of it, because um, this field here was also tested archaeologically about 15 years ago. This is, where is it? This is this field here. And there was more archaeology found there. And you can actually join the dots because there's the two ditches I showed you in the geophysics. Mm -hmm. And you can extrapolate because there was another ditch found here when it was tested for housing. So essentially you have a very large double ecclesiastical enclosure around this. Now it gets better. The more I looked at it, um, there was a sewage scheme went into ferns uh, around about 2000 or 2001 and it was monitored by an archaeologist and a pipe came in the whole way along here and at this point here he found a ditch cut into the road uh, under the roadway mm -hmm. which when I looked at it actually lines up perfectly with where is it with this ditch okay. so it was about here and uh, clone junction, V-shaped ditch, 2.6 meters wide at the top. So that's, that's big, that's respectable. 1.8 meters deep. And he even got a radiocarbon date. Um, so it was AD 331 to 557 AD. So late Iron Age, just at the start of the early medieval period. Now, it's, it's actually, for what could be a monastic ditch, it's quite early. Um, the excavator Frank Ryan classed it as Iron Age, but it just it goes to show um, that there's there's a pattern here. Um, it's if it's at the later end of that date, around five five seven, five five seven, it's in that right kind of monastic period. But we do know that there's also a lot of prehistoric activity because there was an Iron Age ring barrow excavated here. If you go out to Clone Road, there's a reed bed here for a sewage scheme and it was a I think it's first second century AD but it had a lovely collection of Iron Age glass beads in it somebody was cremated with a lovely collection of glass beads um, and there seems to be a flat cemetery probably from the Bronze Age it was found here when this housing scheme was done so I think we're looking at a site in ferns of a lot of archaeology um, some of it prehistoric right up to the, the present day with the 13th century castle here. So I think you can, you can really say Ferns is one serious heritage hotspot, or mm -hmm. certainly archeologically. Um, so and even if you measure out these, what I've, what I've argued are monastic ecclesiastical enclosure ditches, the inner one is about 200 meters. And that's big, that's respectable. The outer is 300 to 350 meters. So obviously there's more room for error there, but they are very respectable, very serious, very large monastic period ditches, if I'm right. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a serious place. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is politically they backed the right horse. But follow the money. <laughs> follow, follow the money. <laughs> um, but uh, that begs a the question then. Um, was Christianity adopted overnight? I doubt it. Um, it was probably a very slow process um, that where people might have hedged their bets. Um, and I'm going to show you an example now of the Gori Bypass, the archaeology from that. Uh, because the road schemes that are being done at the moment, we mentioned Dennis Gorty, um, this was the Gori Bypass, um, have been, because of archaeo archaeologists working on them and in advance of construction, have really been transforming our knowledge of the archaeological record. Um, so Ask is just north of Gorey. You know when you go past the Berry Farm and you're leaving Gorey, you're heading for Arklow, just before you come onto the new bypass, there's a townland called Ask. And they found this incredible complex of archaeology there, um, some of it prehistoric, late prehistoric, um, and they did geophysics either side of it. And so the road came here, but one of the enclosures that they found was this, uh, what is it, eight, so about 20 meters wide, um, with a little entrance there at the north, um, with some cremations here inside it. Now, Christians 
generally didn't get cremated. You were buried east-west in inhumation. Um, but the radiocarbon dates for this cremation were 664 to 770. Um, now, if it was a little bit later, you'd say it was Viking Age, but you didn't really get much Viking activity, certainly not that early. Um, the first date is taken to be 795, so 640 to 770 here. So I think just two ways you could look at this cremation here in, in Ask. Um, oh, I, I didn't say. There was a copper alloy cross-shaped mount, a piece of cross, a, a little bit of a metal cross from the 8th to 10th century found here as well. Um, so I think there's two ways you could look at this enclosure. Um, that maybe the radiocarbon date is a little bit too early um, and that it could be Viking Age. The Vikings went on being cremated until certainly into the 9th century. Um, or what you've got is a holdout pagan community just retaining pagan funerary rituals uh, into the 7th and 8th century. And that's not impossible. Um, because the continuation of cremation is probably a key indicator of pagan ritual practice. Um, so uh, conversion was probably a quite slow process. Um, the one thing we don't have in County Wexford is really good evidence for early medieval trade. Um, this is a particular type of pottery called eware that comes from probably Bordeaux in the 6th and 7th centuries. Now we have a gap here in the southeast, but my bet is it ends up all up and down the west coast of Britain and Ireland. But my guess it's a um, little cup the size of coffee cups, uh, storage jars, jugs, uh, bowls, pretty crude stuff. It's called eware. Um, but there's none from the southeast apart from this one dot near Tremor, uh, this one site near Tremor. Um, is that it simply hasn't been found because the excavations haven't been taking place in County Wexford. Um, but if there was one place I'd put a guess on, um, this is Dawkey Island. You know, you know, when you go up on the train to Dublin and you see this lovely terrace of houses, uh, I think it's Sorrento Terrace, they're very expensive. Um, but there's this island, Dawkey Island, with a Martello Tower and a little church. In the six, seven centuries, there's a, a, there was a promontory fort here and it looks like traders were coming and they'd stop here and this was maybe kind of a neutral trading point. So pottery was being exchanged and probably other goods as well. I don't know what was being traded, probably hides, leather, um, <coughs> possibly even slaves. Um, but sites like this were being used as kind of neutral exchange or mediation points. Um, it's a really interesting place. Now, the obvious category for that here in the southeast is, can anybody name this spot? Saltiness. It's written there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's at Salties. Um, we have very few islands on the east or southern coast. This is one. But there's a promontory fort here. And I just wonder, is that a likely place to start looking? for evidence of trade and importation points like that. There's also talk of a monastery on the Salty Island, and this is known as the Abbey Field. Um, but the problem with that, the, the reference to the Abbey Field is the monks of Tintern owned Salty Island in the 13th and 14th century, and it may be a reference to them. But it's a, it's a fascinating place, not just for birds, but for archaeology as well. There's also an Ohm stone from uh, the 6th century uh, from the Great Salty Island as well. Yeah, that's it there. That's our. <coughs> you have to trust me on it. There's, this is our promontory fort here. Now it's slowly being eroded as well, but uh, I, I'm hoping to get out to it this summer to have a look at it. Um, any you know Bally Trent? Just you know near Carn. Yeah. Um, so there's Carn Beach. Um, Probably one of the biggest ring forts you'll see in County Wexford as well. Um, it's now a luxury garden, isn't it? Or, um, a really well kept garden. Um, but it's a bivalent or possibly tri valet ring fort. And my suspicion is that places like this um, were centres of royalty, possibly even the Ibarca or Fort Kings. And this would have been a power centre, not just looking inland, but out, outwards into the sea as well. Um, and that's a drawing of it from 
1799 by an antiquary called Austin Cooper. So you can see how well the banks were preserved even then. So there's a lot more of this kind of early medieval archaeology under our noses. And this would have been a key point probably for, for a king, just judging by the size and scale of it. Um, I'm nearly there now um, because I'm going to talk about towns and the Vikings because the Vikings came then and in school we were all told that the Vikings were raiders and did terrible things in monasteries and yes that's all true but what we weren't told was that the Irish were as bad at raiding monasteries <laughs> um, especially if they weren't ones for your tribe but eventually the Vikings settled down and began to set up towns um, and what seems to have happened is that the Irish kings cottoned on to the fact that you know these Vikings aren't all that bad um, we can make money off the back of them and they can help us modernize our economies and if we modernize our economies we can become more powerful and this is the trend that happens in the 10th 11th centuries on um, that the Vikings weren't thrown out they were tolerated alliances were formed with them uh, a silver bullion economy was introduced and they became centers of trade and if you have a center of trade and you're a king you can tax it um, so you see towns like Wexford, Waterford, Dublin, Limerick and the really smart progressive kings were developing them it happened a little bit England in, earlier in the, on the continent and in the UK um, but the key standout excavation that gives us an insight into how this was developing in County Wexford was Bride Street, County Wexford uh, sorry, in Wexford Town. Um, you know where Coleman Doyle has that red brick building? Um, I think there's a pub, the Bugler Doyles. Um, now this was excavated, um, it was Coleman Doyle owned it. Um, he's, he's, he passed away a few years ago. Um, and when foundations were being dug, the builders started finding things like waterlogged timbers. And the local historical society said, oh, stop, this could be important. Um, and they were dead right because it was probably one of the best preserved sequences of Viking pre-Norman and medieval houses um, outside of Woodkey or Fishamble Street in Ireland um, because it was simply house after house after house after house. The houses here would have, they would have had a, a lifespan, their timber, of about 15, 20 years and Ireland is pretty damp. So they're, they're rotted, they're rotted from the ground up and probably the roofs as well. Um, and what they simply did was they knocked them down and they built another one on top. So you get layer after layer after layer. So these were excavated by Ed, Ed Burke was his name, he's an archaeologist. He now works for the National Monument Service. Um, but what he got was, um, uh, the drawing isn't great, I'll show you a photograph in a minute, a post, post and wattle walls. And these are very similar to what were found at Woodkey in Dublin. So you'd have a post and wattle wall here, a doorway here, and so the house would have gone around like that. Um, you'd have a central heart, uh, a post here, post here, post here, post here, and maybe a attached roof. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Um, uh, come back. Yeah, so this was a model that was built at the National, Irish National Heritage Park. Um, so you, you get the picture. Um, now this one, had, this one had the walls were daubed with mud. I don't think there was any evidence found for daubing of wattle walls um, in Ireland. Um, certainly not any of the ones I've ever worked on. Um, so it was probably a um, a device to try and make the house and the heritage park last longer. But and th this is the point I want to make. Um, if you look at, remember I said there was a sequence of houses at Bride Street. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There's eleven houses, right? All so this is the earliest one, second earliest, third earliest. So what you have here is a wall, see the black line, and then the inside is a clay floor, and then you have two doorposts here. Then you have another one here, which was later, just built on top of it. Then another one. Um, not sure what happened there, but watch the way the orientation of the houses shift. Mm. See the way they go from being like that 
to like that. <coughs> now, what was going on? Well, these ones that are facing down the page lined up effectively on the modern street pattern. You know, the modern layout of grid of houses. Okay. Whereas this one, the first tree, um, which probably date from about 1000 to 1050, were facing off at an angle. Um, and what this probably suggests is that the modern street pattern that we see in Bright Street, um, South Main Street, was probably only formalized, I would guess, around 1050. So in other words, somebody only got around to laying out the street pattern about 1050, maybe 1100. Now, what was going on elsewhere? Well, if you go somewhere like Dublin, um, around about 1100, they started building stone walls around Dublin because the O'Brien Kings had figured out that these were places worth developing and worth investing in because the more you invested in them, the more trade, and the more you could tax and the more power. Um, so my suspicion is that the Akinsale Kings, the McMurrows, um, started planning with the Vikings around about 1050, 1100, to rationalizing and formalizing property boundaries. And it's probably evidence of an overarching central authority, like a corporation that was laying out plots and patterns. Urban planning is what you call it. Um, because that property pattern has stayed with us. There's that, that was the 19th century alignment. And there it is again, look, um, the whole way up. Um, so I suppose the point I'm really trying to make is that um, you've got this kind of fuzzy urban development from about 1000. Now, what, what was going on before 1000 is a, a, an even more interesting question. Um, I'll come back on that. Um, up, to, up to about 1000, this kind of alignment, about 1050 to 1100, everything gets straightened out and rationalized. And when the Anglo-Normans came, they attacked the town, which was defended. And my, one, my, 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 my suggestion is that around about 1100, 1200, or 1100, around about the time they were straightening these things out, they were building the defenses and organizing what we call a modern town today. Um, and that's probably the key point in a lot of these towns. So what I'm arguing is that it wasn't just the Anglo-Normans they were setting up and doing urban planning. They did that on a much bigger scale, but this was going on in the pre-Norman period as well. Now, the big question is if these houses at the earliest levels in Bride Street, and there have been more of these excavated in Wexford Town as well, but I'm, I've never seen the dating and I've never seen any as early as these ones, around about 1050, 1100. If we know that there are references to the Vikings of Loch Gorman in 888, in the late 9th century, and all through the early 10th century. Where were they? Nobody knows. Um, and the game changer in this was about 2005 or six. Um, if you're ever on the Waterford Bypass and you go across the new bridge and you know Mount Congreve Garden, there's a big sweep in the road, goes inland a little bit um, between Mount Congreve and say, the Tremor Turnoff. Um, and the reason for that is because a site called Woodstown was found. And Woodstown was a 9th century Viking raiding base where they were cutting up, cutting up hack silver, little bits of gold, weighing it. We found all their weights there. Uh, even a couple of Viking warrior burials as well. It's all been published. If you Google Woodstown, County Waterford. Um, and what, what it effectively means is there was an earlier version of Waterford. And at some point, they left or they moved. And it begs the question, is there an earlier version of Wexford somewhere up in this estuary, in the area around Wexford Harbour? It could be Beggarin, because we know that they were out there as well. Um, so it's really, there was a kind of a fuzzy, hazy period of Viking settlements that led to towns, which we don't fully understand. Um, but thanks to this excavation, we can say that around about 1050, 1100, this change in alignment happened. Um, but the question is, where was the earliest Viking settlement? But we're not alone in that. There are questions like that still about Dublin, despite all the excavations. Waterford as well. Um, 
So we've learned a lot from a lot of this kind of archaeological work over the last number of years. Um, it's told, tell us, told us an awful lot about the archaeology of the pre-Norman period. Um, I think I'm onto my last slide. You'll be glad to hear. Um, and what we've done, just to try sum up, we've looked at Ferns, Tamun, Cairnsoar and other places. Um, so in terms of the early church, there's a lot more there than we ever thought about when you looked at it, when we looked at it. Um, despite the comments of the Royal Society of Antiquaries in the 1930s when they visited and said everything is medieval, um, there's actually a much stronger early medieval signal than previously thought. Um, but like any discovery, it's a product of accidental discoveries, having scholars and interested people here, antiquarian activity, the absence of a university, and until recently, a lack of linear infrastructural projects, roads, gas pipelines. But even looking at this in a kind of high level way, or the very kind of quick survey I've done with you, um, I think it can show that the early medieval period was transformative, the origins of Christianity, monasticism, um, in the 6th, 7th dynasty, and eventually what happened to them, um, and then those urban origins. And I think if you look at kind of Wexford landscape, you can pick up a lot of these traits. The, the, the emergence of the church, a diocese called Ferns, named after a McMurrah hotspot or political power center. Um, somebody cottoning on to the fact, probably in the McMurrah dynasty, that a Viking settlement in Wexford made good business sense and was a basis for developing their own power. Um, and these kind of trends were going on all across Ireland uh, from the 10th, 11th centuries on where the economy was starting to develop. And Wexford is no different. Thank you. I, I've thrown an awful lot at you. Have you any questions? <laughs> Who said that? Yeah. Excavation is obviously fairly expensive. You know, they might say, right, I guess, not sometimes as well. I'm just coming in on some of the earlier sites you mentioned, Bowles in particular, and then just taking in the 70s, was it? Mm. And then Begum in the chambers, you mentioned the Begum. Is there any of that material that's still existing in the museum that someone could go to their video garden dates on and maybe just get a bit of snippets of information? That it could be? The, the current sore burials were reburied um, on the site, um, so it's, I don't think it's possible to, to get them easily. Um, and then even if you were to find them, would you know that the ones you found now were the right ones to date, to get a proper radiocarbon date based on the church? Um, so that would be difficult. Um, the really annoying thing about Beggarin is in the report of that timber causeway, he mentions a drawing. But I've checked the Royal Irish Academy, I've checked the Royal Society of Antiquaries, nobody can find the drawing. So that could have been really illuminating. But my guess is it's still in the ground out there. The bridge that runs, it's not like that noise but, yeah. yeah, now if it is a bridge, it could be a jetty. I might be, I might be over-interpreting it as a, as a bridge. But it's, it's a kind of a tidal lagoon, is my estimation of that harbour before reclamation. It wouldn't have been impossible. It just would have taken a lot of timber and manpower. Uh, so it's probably still in the ground. And I think Beggarin is a site that would repay a little bit more attention as well. Mm -hmm.